guys and welcome to How to Gastro. In today's video, we will be talking about quite an interesting pathology and that is Hepatitis D. So let's get started. So before we get into the specifics of Hepatitis D itself, let's do a quick review on what is Hepatitis. So Hepatitis is the inflammation of the tissue of the liver. The most common cause of the disease is by viral infection, however, the disease can also occur secondary to heavy alcohol intake, certain medications, toxins, other infectious diseases, autoimmune diseases, and also a non-alcoholic steatohepatitis form, which is basically liver inflammation and damage that is caused by a buildup of fat in the liver. So from this definition, we gather that hepatitis means the inflammation of the liver. And if you look at this picture on my left, you see the healthy liver above, and below we have an inflamed liver. And that is basically what hepatitis is. There are also many things that may cause hepatitis. Most commonly, hepatitis may be due to a virus, but other medications, toxins, heavy alcohol use may also contribute to the development of hepatitis. So now that we know what hepatitis is, let's take a closer look at the viral causes for hepatitis. So what are the types of viral hepatitis? Viral hepatitis is classified into five different types because each of them express different symptoms and require different treatments. There are five main types of viral hepatitis. They are hepatitis virus type A, type B, type C, type D, and type E. So I have done videos on A, B, and C. So if you guys want to give those videos a watch, you certainly can. I'll put those links in the description for those videos. So in today's video, we're just going to focus on hepatitis virus type D. So what is hepatitis D? Hepatitis D also known as the hepatitis delta virus, is a disease caused by the hepatitis D virus, which is also commonly known as HDV. The disease is very aggressive and is said to be the most severe of all hepatitis infections. The hepatitis D virus causes a unique infection that requires the assistance of the hepatitis B virus in order to replicate and infect hepatocytes. The hepatitis B surface antigen which is known as HBS AG from the hepatitis B virus, is used for the encapsulation of the hepatitis virus genome. So something very interesting about the hepatitis D virus is that in order for it to infect someone, it actually needs the assistance of the hepatitis B virus. So basically that means that the patient will not be able to get the hepatitis D infection if they are not infected with the hepatitis B virus. And that is because hepatitis D relies on the hepatitis B virus in order to survive and replicate in the human host. So if you look at my picture on the left, you can see that this antigen, which is the HBSAG, which is the surface antigen of the hepatitis B virus, actually forms sort of like an envelope around the hepatitis D virus genome. And this is something that it actually requires for its survival in the human host. Therefore, the disease can only occur in a currently infected hepatitis B positive patient or a previously infected hepatitis B patient. So let's go on to the next slide. So the hepatitis D virion is composed of an outer lipoprotein envelope that is made of the surface antigen of the HBV and an inner ribonucleoprotein structure in which the HDV genome resides. So here again, we have the RNA of the HDV virus that resides within this capsule of the HBS lipoprotein envelope. So its clinical course may range from acute self-limited infection to acute fulminant liver failure. Chronic liver infection can lead to end-stage liver disease and associated complications can include accelerated fibrosis, liver decompensation, and the development of a hepatocellular carcinoma. So basically, all stages of liver failure can exist in a patient with hepatitis D. So what are the causes of the hepatitis D virus? Transmission of HDV can occur either as a simultaneous infection with HBV, which means it occurs as a co-infection, or it can also occur as a super-infection, in which case the HDV can infect a person which is already chronically infected with the hepatitis B virus. So basically, a co-infection means that we get both the hepatitis B and D virus at the same time for the first time, and a super-infection means that we have a chronic hepatitis B and then we contract a hepatitis D infection. So hepatitis D is spread in similar ways to hepatitis B because the virus is found in the blood. 
Therefore, whenever blood from an infected person enters the bloodstream of a person who is not immune, there is a risk of transmission. The hepatitis D infection occurs most commonly through parenteral transmission, and this means sharing injected equipment, such as in the cases of IV drug users who share needles, or tattoo or piercing parlors using infected needles, or through needle stick injuries, such as in healthcare exposure. It can also occur from receiving a blood transfusion of infected blood. It is less common for hepatitis D to be spread through sexual contact or mother-to-baby transmission, but of course, this can occur. So now that we know what the causes of hepatitis D are, let's look at some signs and symptoms of the disease. The symptoms of hepatitis D may not always be present, but if they are, they can be very similar to that of a hepatitis B infection. In some cases of hepatitis D, the infection may make the symptoms of the hepatitis B worse. It can also cause symptoms to appear in people who have hepatitis B but have never had symptoms. Some of these symptoms may include a yellowing of the skin and the eyes, which is called jaundice, experiencing joint pain or fever, having abdominal pain, having vomiting or nausea, experiencing a loss of appetite, having dark urine or pale stools, and experiencing fatigue. So how can one diagnose a hepatitis D? So the blood test is actually the most essential component to diagnose a patient with hepatitis D. So in the blood, we can look for anti-HDV Ig antibodies, and these are positive in persons who are exposed to the hepatitis D virus and can persist even after viral clearance. We can also look for the anti-HDV IgM antibody, and this is positive in acute infections and may actually persist in many patients with a chronic infection. We can also look for the HDV RNA, and this is a marker of the hepatitis D virus replication and it is positive in a chronic infection and negative in a spontaneous or treatment-induced viral clearance. It can also be used to monitor or predict treatment response. So moving along, we can also test for certain markers of a hepatitis B infection to assist us in the diagnosis of a hepatitis D infection. Because again, we said the hepatitis D virus cannot exist if the hepatitis B virus is not positive in a patient. So we can also check the blood levels of the HBSAG, which is the surface antigen of the hepatitis B virus. And this will be positive in patients infected with the hepatitis D virus. And higher levels will be correlated with the HDV presence or the HDV RNA. So if these titers fall, which means lower levels of the HBSAG, it means we have sort of a HDV clearance, which means a response to treatment or the body's fighting the infection quite well. We can also use the HBSAG to monitor and predict treatment response. We can also check the level of the HBEAG, and this is the hepatitis B envelope antigen, and this is actually negative in about 85% of patients. We can also look for the HBV DNA because the hepatitis B virus is a DNA virus, whereas the hepatitis D virus is an RNA virus. So we can look for the HBV DNA, and this will actually be suppressed by the hepatitis D virus and negative or low levels are found in most patients. However, it can be increased in patients with detectable HBE antigens, which is the hepatitis B envelope antigen. And if these levels peak, they can actually reactivate the hepatitis B virus due to spontaneous or treatment-induced clearance of the hepatitis D virus. And of course, we can also check the ALT levels, and this will be increased in most patients. So the liver enzymes will increase because the hepatitis means the inflammation of the liver. And if the liver is undergoing sort of a change in its structure or in chronic cases, fibrosis, and is unable to perform its daily tasks, which means there's some sort of a liver failure, the liver will send out these special enzymes, sort of like an help or a SOS signal. And these are the ALT, the AST, and the GGT, and they will increase in the blood report. And the levels of these don't necessarily correlate with the degree of the histological liver damage. So they can be highly increased in very little inflammation or very decreased in a very high amount of inflammation and fibrosis. So it doesn't necessarily mean that they're proportionate with each other. So these serological markers, which are essential in the testing for the hepatitis B virus, can determine whether a person has a co-infection or a chronic superinfection as they are two different conditions with two different outcomes. So remember again, we said the co-infection occurs when both the hepatitis D virus and the hepatitis B virus are contracted simultaneously, 
and this causes an acute HDV and HBV infection. Depending on the relative amounts of HBV and HDV, one or two episodes of hepatitis occurs. So if we look at my graph above, so we see the HDV RNA and the HSB surface antigen enter the blood at the same time. And we can see the peaking of the IgM anti-HDV as well as the total anti-HDV antibodies. And then after some time, we will see the peaking of the anti-HBS antibody. So a super infection occurs when chronic hepatitis B virus carriers are infected with the hepatitis D virus. And this leads to severe acute hepatitis and chronic hepatitis D infection in about 80% of cases. And super infection is associated with a fulminant form of viral hepatitis. So I want you guys to compare the HDV RNA and the HBS AG in terms of time after exposure in the two cases. You can see it's much more severe here, as well as we have early peaking of the liver enzymes as well as the total anti-HDV which will steadily increase whereas in a co-infection it will slowly decrease. So those are a few things that you need to keep in mind. We can also use imaging studies or staging studies to diagnose a hepatitis and this is usually done by two ways, an abdominal ultrasound or a vibration control transient elastography such as a fibroscan and fibromax. And these actually assess the liver damage as well as the fibrosis degree and are an easy way to check for the development of any hepatocellular carcinomas. And finally, let's talk about the treatment of hepatitis D. So the vaccine for hepatitis B actually protects against the hepatitis D virus because of the dependence of the hepatitis D virus on the presence of the hepatitis B virus for it to replicate. So it's really important to get vaccinated for hepatitis B because if we don't develop the hepatitis B infection, we cannot develop the hepatitis D infection. So the hepatitis D or the Delta virus can be treated with high dose of interferon, as high as 9 million units three times per week for one year, although as many as 70% of patients clear the virus and normalize enzyme levels, almost all patients relapse at some point after therapy. Liver transplantation can be considered in cases of severely decompensated patients in cases of fulminant liver failure. So decompensation means when the body cannot compensate for the failing liver and it's basically not able to clear any more toxic materials or salvage any part of the liver to help it carry out any form of detoxification. And this is actually very severe and very sad. So another thing that I will just mention is that alcohol and certain medications should also be avoided and this is because these are usually metabolized by the liver and if the liver is in a state of failure or decompensation we don't want to stress the liver out anymore so we usually avoid alcoholic beverages and certain medications that are actually metabolized by the liver and that brings us to the end of this video on hepatitis d thank you guys so much for watching please make sure to like comment subscribe and share Hope you found the presentation very interesting and informative. If you would like to download a copy of the presentation, you may do so by clicking the link in the description. Take care and bye for now.